I took my yard at the back of my layout and I redid it completely. Yep, look at that. After a year of procrastinating and looking at bare homosote, it's finally done. Wow, look at that. Well, mostly. There's still a few parts I missed. But you know what we call that? Future content. That was really stupid. Why'd I say that? Anyways, as for the main section of the yard, it's all done. All the hallmark features of a yard are present. We've got an engine shed with a big old diesel just chilling out. There he is. Got an engine servicing facility. And man, it turned out really nice. Love how that concrete pad gives it a really cool industrial look. We've got water columns for refueling engines. Lots of spare parts laying around. Even that little guy is working around it all. Look at him go. Uh, he's cleaning stuff. That guy's oiling the engine. This guy, uh, he's, um, I don't know, supervising. Anyways, we even got a little guy shoveling coal or ash or something. Just lots of hustle and bustle going on here. Very busy place. And I'm super proud of how this turned out. And you know what? You can build a scene like this on your layout too. No crazy techniques or super advanced know-how needed. Just some basic materials off of Amazon and some scenery tools. And you can have your own engine yard. And you know what? I'm going to do that today. I'm going to walk you through the entire process of how I did my yard and show you the triumphs and failures through the entire process. So come along with me as we build a realistic rail yard. Okay, let's give a rundown of what our plan's gonna be. As you can see, my yard isn't set up in the most conventional of ways. But, um, to be honest, it's got this weird switchback design, and in the context of switching cars, it's pretty stupid, if we're being honest. It works perfectly for switching engines around. Uh, most diesels will be able to make it around the switchback to get to the engine shed or inner siding, and some small steam engines are able to do it as well. Uh, specifically things like my Mogul or my 060T. Heck, I've been able to fit even an entire bipolar back there. It never ceases to amaze me. As for the outer siding, you can fit almost anything on it. I've actually been able to fit an entire cab forward or a Class A on that siding, so large steam engines have no issues fitting there. Alright, so now you know how the track layout works, so here's a game plan. It pays to be organized and have a battle strategy. Our first priority is to cover the remaining bare homosote between the yard tracks with brown cover. Uh, I've already tested this on the far side here, so we can just replicate it for the rest of the layout. After that, ooh, be the most daunting part, uh, creating the concrete pads for the engine servicing facility. Uh, at the time, I absolutely had no idea how I was going to do this, so I was just praying that I wouldn't screw this up. Last but not least, I wanted to figure out how I wanted to detail the top of the concrete pads to break up the emptiness. Break up the emptiness. Uh, sounds like the name of a... A band that high school kids listen to when they feel misunderstood. Why am I talking about this? St stick to the script. Anyways, I, I wanted to replicate something that was uh, similar to Southern Pacific's Mission Bay Roundhouse, uh, how they stored all the GS4s. So uh, I had an idea in mind, but I mean, I figured that out eventually. And there it was three straightforward phases to redoing my yard. Um, I, I can't even remember what they are, and I just recorded the lines. Ugh. Anyways, uh, first up was ground cover, which uh, hopefully would have been pretty straightforward. Alright, ground cover. One of the most critical parts about doing scenery. It serves as the foundation for the look you're trying to convey and, uh, guess what? Uh, yeah, I already screwed it up before I even started. Yep, at zero foresight and messed it all up. You know, when most people are creating a rail yard, they have black ground cover to represent cinders and soot building up. Oh no, uh, not me. I, I was on a mission to ballast all my track on my layout, and I, I tend to do it section by section on my workbench rather than on my layout. Uh, this process allows me to paint the rails and cover the ties properly instead of just doing the sides of the roadbed. But in my crusade against naked fast track, I neglected to consider that I'd ever want my yard to be a different color of ground cover. Yeah. Uh, I tried using more of the same ground cover I had for my ballast, but it just, just didn't look right. I didn't like how it looked, and I just ended up leaving it like that for months. Fast forward a few months, and I went to my buddy Matt R's layout. He uh, recently done an expansion on his layout and added a yard. Uh, just like me, he had used gray ballast and fast track, and he had to fill the areas in between. Uh, he decided to go with a blend of reddish-brown ground cover, and I really like that. Give it a nice West Coast vibe, and I wanted to copy that for my own layout. In fact, I was ready to take this man down and steal a secret formula, but uh, 
He's actually kind enough to not only give me the recipe, but uh, give me the materials as well. So special thanks to Matt R. at West Chicago Model Railroad for helping me out. And uh, thanks to this man that I can show you how to make this mix for yourself for your own layouts. So uh, we'll head on to the kitchen and make a fancy mix like those big food YouTubers do. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to Banging with Bimbish, and this week we are taking a special look at my recipe for Railroad Yard Ground Cover. So first up, you want to steal a medium-sized Tupperware from your spouse and get your family's heirloom dollar store plastic spoon. This will be essential for the mixing process. We're going to introduce our ingredients in question and bring out our full selection of spices from Woodland Scenics. Today we'll be using brown coarse ballast, fine ballast cinders, gray coarse ballast, earth fine turf, and gray medium ballast. As you can see, I'm running a tad low on my medium gray ballast, but for purposes I'll be able to make it work. You'll also want to get a big bag of Brennan's Better Ballast to bite it all together. These will all come together to make the perfect medley of spices to form the basis for our ground cover. We'll move these out of the way and start with the main studs of our cocktail, the brown coarse ballast and our Brennan's Better Ballast. Twist the top of your shaker and give 4 heaping teaspoons of brown coarse ballast. We really want to get a big serving of this as it will serve as a delicious foundation for our cocktail and the brown will give color to our mixture. Give it a good shake to distribute it evenly at the bottom of the tub, and grab a bag of your Brennan's Better Ballast and add 2 tablespoons to give it some variety to the mixture. We only want 2 tablespoons since we want it to complement our mixture and not overpower the brow. Next up, we'll bring out our gray coarse and medium ballasts. We'll start with our gray coarse ballast and add 1 tablespoon to the mixture. This will be so we can help blend our ground cover with my existing ballast so the transition isn't nearly as jarring. Sprinkle it gently over the top like you're dusting a fine French confectionery. Or just dump it all in there, really it's up to the chef's choice in the end. Next, we'll scrounge up whatever remainder we have in our gray medium ballast and throw it in over the top. This will help to add some texture to our gray so our ballast doesn't have that boring uniform look to it. Then we'll get our hands dirty and mix it all together so it gets evenly blended. Make sure you get to the very bottom of the mixture as well so nothing gets missed. Finally, you want to make sure we tone down the brightness of our cocktail with some dark earthy tones. Whip out your favorite bottle of Earth Fine Turf and add roughly about a tablespoon to the top. I personally add a little bit less than that, but add what you think is reasonable to your own personal tastes. Lastly, we need to add some heat to our cocktail. Pull out your shaker of fine cinder ballast and haphazardly dump a whole tablespoon worth into your mixture. This will darken the overall look of your ground cover and bring the whole thing together. Following your tactical dump, feel free to make a fool of yourself into your best disgraced chef impression and messily sprinkle cinders all over your cocktail like salt bay. Following your failed chef impression, once again get your hands dirty and give the whole concoction a healthy mixing by hand until all the ingredients are fully incorporated. Once again, make sure to get all the way down to the bottom so all the fine ingredients are missed. Now onto the most crucial step, plating. Whip out your nicest porcelain plate from your mother's kilo cabinet and spoon a healthy serving for your future dinner guests. Make sure to do so delicately before throwing caution to the wind and dumping more on top. Remember to get your fingers all up in there as dinner guests appreciate someone else's hands already being in their food. Finally, take your signature sprig of parsley and carefully lay it onto the side. And voila, the perfect railroad yard ballast. Hey, welcome back. Hopefully I didn't get a cease and desist letter from Binging with Babish. Uh, now that we've mixed up our ground cover, we can get to the easy part, applying it to the layout. Pretty straightforward stuff, just sprinkle it on top of the layout and add a bit of scenic glue on top. Uh, a much smarter man would have painted the table first, but you know what, we charge it in head first and don't look back. Uh, I was able to finish the area pretty quickly and I gotta say it was pretty relaxing. I put on one of Norm's videos in the background and I went to town on the layout. Finally I secured the ground cover down with some wet water and scenic cement. Now for the uninitiated, wet water is just normal water with a few drops of dish soap in it. Uh, it helps you to break the surface tension so your scenic cement will soak on through. I personally use scenic cement from what Scenics, it's pre-mixed and works pretty well. If you're uh, not wanting to buy it pre-made, you can save some money by buying some white glue from the dollar store and mix it in. Once I was all done, I was able to move on to the most daunting task ahead. So, the scene was set, which meant no more procrastinating the task ahead. This was probably the part I was dreading the most. I had a rough idea in mind of what I wanted. I did some research on the SP's engine servicing facilities at Mission Bay, and I talked to my buddies Matty C and Greg from the NLOE for advice. In the end, I decided to go with a concrete pad with expansion joints that would be level with the roadbed. In order to accomplish this effect, I went with my favorite material for modeling concrete, PVC foam board. Now, I like this stuff because it's lightweight and easy to cut. Not to mention, it's very mess-free and doesn't require you to use any plaster. I got mine off of Amazon, and I only needed a few sheets to do my entire yard. 
First order of business was measuring out the area where PVC foam would rest. I personally used Fast Track, which adds an added advantage to having a molded in roadbed. I trimmed the foam so it rested on the outer lip of the Fast Track so it was level with the rails. I also made sure to run a car or an engine through to make sure everything had enough clearance. After that, I took my cut sections of foam and I put it back to my workbench. The nice thing about this material, it's very soft and easy to engrave expansion joists into. I lightly marked out squares that were 2 by 2 inches and was content with the results, so I pushed down firmly with the tip of the mechanical pencil to engrave the joints into the foam. You want to use the tip of the lead to engrave the foam so you have a nice cut rather than the gutter type groove at the end of the mechanical pencil will form. Next up was painting. In the past, I used concrete paint from Woodland Scenics to do my sidewalks in my town, but not this time. No. I uh, didn't want my yard to have the same look. I wanted to go for something more industrial and grimy. I ended up spraying each foam section with Rust-Oleum Satin Stone Gray. This gives it a nice dark gray and saves me the hassle of having to paint each section by hand. Ugh. After that dries, I hit it with a black wash from a spray bottle. I recommend getting a spray bottle that shoots out a fine mist, otherwise you get a concentrated blast rather than an even coating. Most folks use a mix of India ink and water, but that was something I just didn't have access to. Instead, I had a few drops of Tester's black enamel paint mixed in with water. There's really no particular ratio I used. I kind of eyeballed it, so if I were to guess, probably five to eight drops would do. Now, the mixture is sprayed over the flat gray to add some grime and depth to the concrete. Use a paper towel to dab off any excess and add as many layers of grime as you want to get your desired result. Now, if that looked good to you, then you're more than welcome to go ahead and install it on your layout. But for me, oh no, I uh, want to be fancy and go the extra mile. I want to darken the expansion joints and weather it by hand. Now, I know that sounds very scary and complicated, and I don't blame you for thinking that. But I promise you, it's really simple if you're willing to give it a try. You could probably get the same result by using a black wash with India ink again, but it's not something I had at the time. To weather your concrete like I did, you'll need to have some black weathering powder, a brush, and a flat stick. Uh, personally, I used a bezel breaker from a smartphone repair kit, but a popsicle stick will do just as well. Take your brush and lightly apply some weathering powder along the seam of the joint. You don't want to press it down into the joint quite yet, but we're just going to lightly apply it to the foam. Next, grab your tool and make a few passes over the joint horizontally to push the weathering powder into the crevice. Once you've done it along the entire seam, do the same process going the other direction. Feel free to repeat the step as many times as needed until the joint has been darkened to your personal tastes. Now, if you went a little overboard like I did, uh like too much powder? Don't worry. If you spray some water over the section and wipe it off with a paper towel, it'll give you a nice clean edge. Repeat the process for the remaining joints and ooh, look at that. You've got an expertly weathered concrete pad to add to your layout. Now after test fitting your concrete pad to your layout, you may come to the same awkward conclusions I did. That uh, from certain angles your concrete pad levitates and defies gravity. There are a few ways to remedy this. Easiest way is to use ground cover to hide the edge of the pad, but since I had such huge areas to cover, I ended up building supports for my engine servicing facility. To create set of supports, I cut out a centimeter tall strip of PVC foam and cut a notch at the ends to match the angle of the roadbed. A neat trick you can do is line the strip behind the edge of the roadbed and trace it to get the desired angle. For the trim pieces, cut out of a half centimeter strip and space them out accordingly. Again, I eyeballed mine and glued them in place. For paint, I repeated a lot of the techniques we used for the concrete pads. I hit it with a coat of satin stone gray and a black wash. After that, I go over it with a heavy coating of black weathering powder. As you can see, I attempted to put a layer of dirt and dust toward the bottom of that. And it all got covered with black weathering powder anyway, so uh, just uh, just ignore that. The goal is to make the supports darker than the concrete pad itself, so it gives some nice visual contrast. After that, bring your newly built supports to your layout and ooh, there you go. Take a step back and appreciate your newly completed concrete pads. And now it was time to add the finishing touches. As the old saying goes, the devil's in the details. This is the part I enjoy the most, since details can really bring a scene to life. First, I wanted to add some busyness and clutter to the yard. To accomplish this, I went to my parts bin and grabbed some spare parts from old repairs or broken models. I'd also picked up some brass detail parts from my local train show. Pulled them all out and arranged them in the yard to simulate storage of spare parts. I had abundance of extra wheels from truck conversions, so I laid them in a row and dirtied them up with some light weathering. I also had some extra signs from Titchy, so I painted them up and placed them on the yard to ward off trespassers. Dot around the scene are some yard lamps from Woodland Scenic's plug and play system. They really bring night shots to life and add a lot to the scene. Sadly, in my case, they've been a constant pain in my rear since I've never actually been able to get them to work consistently. They sporadically work and never all 
the same time. And no joke, they will randomly alternate on which ones will turn on after long periods of time. I have tried everything under the sun to make them work, ranging from putting them on their own power supply or buying new ones entirely, and they, they're still temperamental. In my next video, I'll be trying out a new replacement system for my current light, so hit subscribe if you're interested. Another way to add details are spare ties from Gargrave's track. My local hobby shop sells small bags of them for 99 cents, and they're a great way to add line sign details to an area that would normally be an empty space. Speaking of track, many years ago I had purchased a small lot of MTH scale tracks, which, uh, ended in disastrous results. Embarrassed and ashamed, I had, uh, banished them under the layout. However, I was able to salvage a few of the straight sections and place them around the yard for my maintenance of way crews to use. I also had a spare AHM 7 Pacific boxcar lying around, so I weathered the heck out of it and built up a foundation with old railroad ties. Now we can live out a happy retirement as a storage shed for the yard. Another large structure I added to my yard was the addition of a gantry crane. I wanted to add something that would give both some height to the yard and give it that industrial feel that I was looking for. While browsing online, I saw that folks had used the HL gantry crane kit from Walther's. Eager to replicate this, I ordered one for myself. However, I let my excitement get the better of me and I uh, actually ordered the wrong one. One, so it was too short for my purposes. It still looks good, but I think later on I'll have some taller supports 3D printed so I can correct this. But for now, the crane just sits next to the support so engines can pass through. To add some life to the scene, I picked up some MTH Railroad employee figures. There's quite a few included, and the range of actions and poses is pretty impressive. I personally think they are essential for scene building, since it gives that human touch to a world that's otherwise just metal and machine. I have a few posed around key areas around the yard, such as this water tower, which was built from an old Walther's kit. And with that, we've reached the end of our project. Looking back, there are definitely areas that could have been improved, but for my purposes, I'm pretty happy with the results. There's lots of opportunities for photos, and I love watching the trains run through. I hope this video was helpful, and you picked up a few tips and tricks along the way, and you're able to try some of these on your layout too. Now, I'm not an expert modeler by any stretch of the imagination, and this was the first time we've ever tackled a project like this, and I'd say it turned out pretty nicely. If you enjoyed this instructional style of video, please leave a like, and let me know what else you think I should add to the yard. Once again, thank Thank you so much for coming along on this journey with me, and I'll catch you in the next one.